short of it. Easy. Welcome to the RAS Network. What you're about to hear and see is limited to general financial information only. Please be sure to speak to your financial planner or refer to our financial services guide available at rask.com.au slash FSG before acting on the information. Good day, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. Hello and welcome to Rask Live for this week. I see that Deepak did say that we've set a new record for starting a few minutes after the deadline. So thank you for bearing with us as we uh, set up a few things. We've got heaps of wonderful charts and graphs to visualize what it means to be an ETF investor. So we'll be joined today by Tom Wickenden from Beta Shares as we talk through basically all the different types of ETFs you might come across. We can talk about portfolio construction and all different types of things as it relates to ETF investing. And we're basically asking the question of like, how the ETF did we get here? Uh, it's no surprise to many of you that ETFs have really taken the investing world by storm over the past, maybe say 10 to 20 years. So we'll find out why that might be the case and how investors are using them in 2023. So I can see uh, Karina's already got in with the question, what is the difference between an ETF that follows an index and an index fund? Which one gives more return? Those are good questions, Karina. We will have time for questions with Tom uh, after a short presentation, but in, before we get to Tom, before we cross to him, I've actually got a few slides of my own that I wanted to share with you. So as you know, we go live every Wednesday, sometimes at 6 p.m., sometimes at 12 p.m., sometimes at 12.08 p.m. Uh, depends if we're running scientifically to time or not. So if you haven't already subscribed, no matter where you're watching this, if you're on Self Wealth's YouTube channel, the RASC YouTube channel, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, the ASA YouTube channel, Wherever you are, don't forget you can subscribe and follow along and you will receive notifications every time we go live. Here's this week's joke. My wife hated my impulse purchase of a revolving chair, but then she sat on it. Eventually, she came around. That is my joke for this week. And indeed, I am sitting on one of these chairs right now, uh, ergonomically designed too, I might add. Um, so this one's uh, close to home because my wife is also an OT, an occupational therapist. So... Uh, I'm sure she'll appreciate that one and I can uh, maybe share it with her so she can try it on with her colleagues. Um, okay, Rob's given me a 9 out of 10 for the joke. That's actually pretty good over on the self Wealth channel. So Rob, thank you for that. G'day, Sala. Welcome to the chat. Uh, we have a lot to get through today, but if you did notice earlier on, I did put a bit of a, a link in the uh, the Google, uh, sorry, link to a Google form in the chat here. Uh, and it goes to this page, which ha helps you and helps me get better, I guess, content and information across to you in 2024. We do these surveys basically every few months at RASC, but also on the Self Wealth Live channel. We've done a couple in the past. And so if you just take a few moments either now or after the, the live is done, it only takes maybe one or two minutes, depending on how long you want to commit. Uh, what we're trying to understand from people going forward is we're trying to understand some of their biggest regrets and successes with money or investing so that we can try and help more people avoid some of those mistakes and share in some of those successes. So that's the survey we've got going on so far. So if you could, it'd be great if you can help me out. Okay, coming up on Rask Live for the remainder of this year, uh, we have the Christmas special that will come up the week of Christmas uh, in the lead up there, uh, we've got property and shares next week with Pete Wargent, one of Australia's best property economists, some might say the best. He's also a property coach and he co-hosts the Australian Property Podcast um, here at RASC. Today, we've got nothing but ETF Q&A with Tom Wickenden from Beta Shares. Um, Tom's appeared on the Self Wealth Live program, the predecessor to RASC Live. Uh, and I got to admit some of the slides he brought that day were some of the best I've seen. Uh, at least the best on the live series thus far in the years that we've been running it. And you're probably thinking, yeah, well, Owen, your slide game is pretty good, but it's uh, it's not as good as Tom's, I can assure you that much. Don't forget there's free stuff up for grabs or you can get a ticket to this week's Finance and Fizz event in Melbourne with Ladies Finance Club. You can use the coupon code RASK on the Humantix website. Just Google Ladies Finance Club Melbourne event. Use the coupon code RASK. And maybe Major Street Publishing, many of you have already taken this up. Maybe 50 or 100 books have already been sold through the Rask Live. But if you just Google Major Street Publishing business books, last week we had the author uh, of the Ulysses contract, Mike Kemp, on the show. Uh, Kate Campbell, my co-host, has written the book Buying Happiness, 
They're all available through Major Street Publishing on their website. You can use the coupon code RASKXMAS and get it 50% off. So who knows? Your accountant might even say it's tax deductible if it helps you earn passive income into the future. Uh, and that's it for now. We'll save Charlie's quote for later. And right now, I would like to welcome Tom Wickenden to the Rask Live program. So, Tom, welcome, mate. Good morning, Owen. Morning, everyone. Thanks for thanks for having me on. Always a very a very kind intro. Oh, and I was going to make a, a counter joke to your dad joke, but I'll leave it out because you're kind to my graphs. Okay, well that sounds fair to me, mate. Um, so today we're going to be talking uh, ETFs, everything ETFs. Um, obviously, people familiar with the Beta Shares name here in Australia, the largest ETF uh, issuer in the country by number of ETFs, and one of the biggest in terms of capturing more of investors' dollars. So. Uh, you've got a wealth of data, knowledge, and experience in talking with these things. We did a podcast together recently as well. Um, so I actually have some of your slides locked and loaded. So you can guide me through these. And this is actually for everyone's benefit. This is actually a real treat for me because normally I do have to try and use some artistic flair and put together some slides. But in this case, I get to lean into Tom and the, beat, the talented Beta Shares team to do this. So mate, I'm going to bring this up right now and you can just nudge me through it. And for everyone else's benefit, um, we are going to answer your questions towards the end of uh, the live stream. So we can try and get through this, but if you do have some questions to kind of follow up uh, with Tom on a key point, as we go through, please let me know. And as always, if you're watching this on replay, as many hundreds, if not thousands of people will, you can leave your questions in the comments and I can take a look at them after the fact. So, mate, where do we start? Awesome. Yeah, well, I mean, there's a lot of data, a lot of stats, a lot of figures thrown around about how big the ETF industry is getting, you know, both overseas and here in Australia. And so what I wanted to do with, with this presentation is just take a step back and, and using some of the data we have in-house, just look at where has this growth actually come from? Um, I think it was Karina who mentioned, um, you know, what's the difference between an ETF that follows an index uh, and an index fund? It's a, it's a really... Good question. This presentation tries to break down the different types of ETFs that are out there because some of them are index ETFs, but there are there are other types of ETFs as well. Um, and when these different types of ETFs have contributed to the growth of the entire industry, so we can we can kick off and, and scroll down a little. I think we've already given the um, the usual disclaimer, but I better give one myself as well, just just to note that. You know, everything in this presentation is is general in nature. None of it constitutes, you know, financial advice. I don't, I don't know any of your personal circumstances. Um, so yeah, just just important to consider that. Mm -hmm. And of course, read the product disclosure statements and target market determinations on the Beta Shares website. Please do. Thank you, Owen. You saved me a, a headache with legal there. Um, yeah. So this this is this is it. This is the the ETF industry uh, in Australia. You can see, you know, very small growth initially um, so in the first month we the, the industry grew by a hundred thousand dollars in the first 10 years five billion dollars in the 10 years following that a uh, hundred and forty five billion dollars so wow. for any investor it is it is very hard and maybe um not not responsible to ignore the the substantial growth of the etf and I'm sure a lot of your viewers will know, but ETF stands for Exchange Traded Fund. Um, so a fund that trades in the exchange. Uh, mm -hmm. read it backwards. Um, the, the growth of this industry. Uh, so, yeah, amazing growth. Like, just to give some perspective, so like I mentioned, that first month, um, for instance, the, the entire ETF industry grew by $100,000. Um, last month, beta shares grew by $1 billion. So we're, we're just seeing... Wow. Incredible growth, uh, um, our fastest billion to date, 17 days or something. So it, it really is incredible. So I want to educate investors on, on where this growth is coming from in terms of the different types of it. We can dive in, I reckon, Owen, what's, uh, what's next? Mm -hmm. The agenda. Yeah, so to break down the different uh, – I'll, I'll break down where this growth is coming from, I wanted to look at the different types of ETFs. Um, I'll go into each of these in, in more detail as we go through, but that just gives you a nice, a nice overview. We can jump to the first one, which is you know, what I've called the bedrock of the Australian ETF industry. And it's fair to say this is the bedrock of the global ETF industry as well. Um, oh, and you'd, you'd probably agree that when most investors think about ETFs, and again, this comes back to 
to Karina's question, most investors think about index ETFs um, and pretty broad index ETFs. What yeah. I mean by that is, you know, the ASX 200, a broad index, um, the S&P 500, the NASDAQ 100, even the MISCI world. These are broad market capitalization weighted indices. Um, and that's what I've defined here as broad equity index ETFs, uh, the first category. And the growth of ETFs globally um, has really been synonymous with the growth of core or, or of passive investing, passive index investing. So if we scroll down, what you can see is the majority of the ETF industry in Australia, and apologies, the cars have come through a little bit funny there. It has, you, yeah. you still get the idea. Um, so around 40% of the total ETF industry in Australia um, is made up by what I define as these broad equity index ETFs. Um, of the 10 largest ETFs in Australia, eight of them fall under, under this category. Most of them are following indices I named earlier, so like S&P, the NASDAQ 100, ASX 200. Um, and those eight largest, of the 10 largest, sorry, eight of those are core, and those eight largest actually account for 30% of the total from the entire industry. So, I mean, right off the bat, you can see that is where the majority of growth has come from. Um, and it's really been due to just, you know, over the past 20 or so years, there's been a lot more education around the benefits of passive index investing. Um, I don't want to go into it too heavily in this presentation. It's not really what it's about, but this greater education that's been given to everyday investors and, and professional investors has led them to more and more often invest in passive indices and start to forego potentially higher cost active managers. And this has just happened to coincide with the you know, growth of exchange traded funds. Um, I mean, prior to exchange traded funds, there were just index funds, uh, Karina, to, to, to your question. Those were unlisted funds that aim to track an index. Mm. The difference between that and an exchange traded fund isn't the, you know, what it's aimed to track, but it's the fund structure. Because at the end of the day, an exchange traded fund is just a structure of a fund. You can have actively managed ETFs, which we'll go into. You can have fixed income ETFs, passive ETFs, uh, commodity ETFs. The ETF itself is just a fund structure, uh, which comes with some really, really awesome benefits. Um, such as you know, everyday liquidity, like you expect from your shares since you're trading the exchange. Um, it's a fairly tax efficient vehicle as well. And it also has this um, creation redemption mechanism that means it tends to trade at fair value. So, you know, the introduction of exchange traded funds to the world of finance coincided with the education of the benefits of index investing. So two have just paired together really nicely. Um, so I Tom, think, can yeah, I ask a question? So just yeah. to give an example for people, what you would consider here in this core uh, area, this is supposed to be orange, so apologies for that. But um, what you would consider there is say like the, the A200 ETF, like your Australia 200 ETF. That's exactly right. So, I mean, if you, two of the two of those largest 10, for instance, um, one of them is the A200 ETF, our Beta Shares Australia 200 ETF. So all that is, is, is really low cost access. You're talking four basis points per annum, like $4 for every 10,000 invested. That was less than my, my coffee this morning in Melbourne. Um, <laughs> and our NASDAQ 100 ETF is another example yeah. um, of core, low-cost, um, broad market ETFs. Uh, okay. yeah, good, good, um, good to remind me to bring those up. Thanks, Owen. So that's the better. If we go to the next slide, please, uh, Owen. I've, I've just touched on and um, I'll probably – I might chop and choose as to how much detail I go into each For of sure. these slides. Um but just, just to take a step back, just this is more, I guess, um, investment education rather than about, you know, the growth of the ETF industry itself. But when you're looking for a core exposure in your portfolio, you really want to tick a lot of these boxes because the core is meant to be held there for the long run. So you don't want high fees. You want to actually provide exposure to what you're looking for because typically the starting point is your asset allocation, right? I want to put X amount in Australian equities, Y in international equities, Z in fixed income. You want to make sure the securities you use in each of those baskets um, are actually tracking that asset class and, and passive index ETFs are great at doing that. Mm. Um, so that is, you know, th these principles really align with the principles of core equity index ETFs. And that's why we've seen this massive growth 
uh, of the t- of 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 that um that type of ETF. We see a note here from uh, Rob on the Self Wealth channel to say mm-hmm. that Self Wealth investors have three hundred and fifty million dollars invested in NDQ, which is the Nasdaq one hundred ETF, and A two hundred alone. So, yeah, wow. Uh, there yeah. you go. I found. I just found out myself uh, yesterday that yeah, NDQ is our most it was held by the most amount of investors so almost two hundred thousand different australian investors hold ndq wow uh, which is wow. pretty which is pretty amazing wow okay i like it so if we roll on ah cool this is look i won't stand this too long but this just gives you an example of what we classify these as these core etfs and, and we've already talked about a200 we've talked about ndq which is the first and third columns there um the other two, I'll probably focus on DHHF, which is a really interesting one potentially for this audience. It's a what we call a diversified ETF. So it's actually an ETF holding different ETFs, a bit like ETF Ception. Um, hmm. The premise is, you know, with that one ETF, you get access to Australian equities, international equities, both developed and emerging market. Um, and so it's what we call, a, you know, an all growth ETF. You get access to over 8,000 equity securities in one purchase of a single ETF in the exchange. So it's just a really efficient way to invest it at a really low cost of, of 18 basis points. Um, and that's, you know, that type of investing has become so popular and, and that's why I've seen such, such strong growth. Mm, yeah. And this is, I know that this is a really popular ETF amongst younger investors in particular and people that have got a very long runway um, before they plan on retiring. And as they go on, they tend to complement it with, fixed income and those types of things, which we're going to talk about soon, um, which is this one here on DHHF. And there was a question that came through about the fees for core ETF. So you can see that Tom's laid them out there for you as an example as well. So um, that, that kind of covers that one. I thought this was interesting, not only because of the image, which looks like it was AI generated, but <laughs> um, but also the slogan. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. Um, I might just, there's been a few other uh, questions come through. I just noticed uh, around currency hedging. Um, and so, yeah, for instance, we got like a currency edge version of that NASDAQ fund, and that would also fit in that, that previous category. Um, and at the moment, we are seeing, this is a, a question, sorry, from, I should leave the questions to you, sorry, but Mike Smith, Mike Smith asked, we noticed oh, the yeah. difference in, in flows, given the way the currency is at the moment. We don't really see people go from Aussie to international. We usually see people go international hedged or international unhedged. Um, so mm. it might not be enough context to answer that question but I thought I'd just jump at it while we're, while we're yeah, there. Yeah, no, no, no worries. So so what you're saying is like a lot of people like Mike and myself for this matter, Tom, mm-hmm. we're thinking if we're investing in the United States, the currency, if anyone that is looking to travel overseas, <laughs> um, it's become very expensive because the Australian dollar has fallen a little bit. Um, and so people are now thinking, well, maybe I can hedge my portfolio. Now's the time maybe to start thinking about that. So um, you're seeing people switch to the not switch maybe, but just think about the currency hedged mm-hmm. version yeah. in of terms things of, like NDQ. Yeah, in terms of net new inflows into the industry, we're seeing a lot more go towards currency hedge exposures because, as you put it, if the Aussie appreciates from here, that, that will eat into in unhedged international returns. Yeah, good point. Okay. Right. But yeah, sorry, back to the um, AI-generated dog in a suit. Um, this section is around the, the second largest... Um, the second largest category of ETFs, which are active ETFs. So people are probably familiar with actively managed funds. You know, there are stock pickers, they go out, um, they do their analysis and they choose the stocks they want to buy and you can buy into their funds. Well, as I mentioned, you can have, you know, active managers use the ETF structure. And we've seen a lot of growth in active managers converting their funds into ETFs. Mm. Um, This section comes with a fairly important caveat. So although active ETFs are the second largest category behind core ETFs with 15% of the assets under management in the Australian ETF industry, 90% of that has come on fund conversion. What that means is if there's an existing active manager with an unlisted fund and they convert to the ETF structure, obviously that becomes part of the AUM of the ETF industry. And so 90% of the total AUM has come from conversions. The remaining 10% has been net inflows. Um, if we look at it, you know, a shorter time period, we look over the past three years as I did in my analysis, we've seen a huge amount of conversion of unlisted active managers to um, ETF structured active managers and also new um, actively managed ETFs coming online. Uh, even, even active managers, um, I think, are seeing the, the, the great benefits the ETF structure offers 
Um, and so I, I continue, I, I expect to see this continue um, a lot. I think this would be due to that conversion factor, probably one of the largest growing, um, one of the largest growing categories of ETFs by terms of AUM. But in terms of net inflows, we're seeing a slightly different picture. Mm-hmm. So although those, although the number of active ETFs tripped, doubled, sorry, or more than over the past three years, over that time, we actually saw $2 billion of net outflows from active funds. Um, it goes back to, to, to some of what I touched on earlier, this passive v active debate and, and the education around that. Um, but it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a trend we're seeing alongside the growth of ETFs. We're seeing huge flows into listed ETF vehicles, huge outflows of unlisted funds. And we're also seeing big flows into passive funds and, and sizable outflows from, from active funds. So it's really interesting. So for people's context, I think this deserves a double click because you you mentioned some really good points here, Tom. What what Tom's saying, guys, is that um, a lot of fund managers who you know pick stocks and do all that type of active management, they are recognizing too that ETFs are growing considerably. And this goes back to Karina's point at the very start. Like an ETF, as Tom said, it's just the structure, it's just the wrapper. And what goes inside it is what you should be paying attention to. And so this is really interesting. Uh, in the sense of like where this could go, like in my opinion, just my opinion only, Tom, that I think that most active fund managers in the future will have to have an ETF version of their strategy because we'll all demand that you can buy it um, through your brokerage account and through your platform. So, just sorry, just to chime in with two cents that's, there. That's exactly right. It's probably worth just to on that on that graph there for one more second on the one above. Just worth mentioning, so like for instance, just to try highlight what I mean by this. So this is the total AUM of active managers in ETFs. That huge jump you see, which was I think it was just around 2020, was it? And um, that huge jump, that was a particular active manager converting to the ETF structure. So we saw a huge increase mm. in AUM um, during that yeah. period. But then you can kind of see, um, you know, outflows um, following yeah. these conversions. Yep. Um, and this and is kind of here again. Yeah, exactly right. So we don't need to go over this too much, but this is just showing the inflows into the first category we looked at, so core passive ETFs in the orange bars. So fairly strong inflows over time. And then we see the outflows from active managers. So particularly over the past three or so years, you can see those blue bars um, being quite quite negative. Um, this is just showing the, the flows between passive and active ETFs. And what it basically highlights is that you know, people always say on in the news, like the fund managers or whatever, they'll come out and say it's a stock picker's market. But this would actually show that in a when the market has struggled, actually people are taking their money out and they're putting it into these core ETFs, these long term ETFs, uh, yeah. which is quite interesting. No, we could do it. We could do a whole another po- a whole another webinar on 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 that line, um, a stock picker's <laughs> market. But we won't. We won't. We'll just focus on just the ETFs today and where the growth has come from. So this, this next category is probably the category I'm personally most excited about uh, going forward. So let's, let's, let's take a step back and think about those first two categories. So historically, we've seen lots of money flow into active managers. Um, people want to, you know, use funds that can outperform the market. Uh, previously, there, there wasn't index funds available, sure. Um, but there's always been a strong desire to, you know, outperform the market, which is, which is natural for investors. Um, using the core index ETFs, which has seen the, the most growth, that is that is the market. Okay, mm-hmm. so that's what we consider the market. Education is a bit of buy that. But if you're an investor sitting there saying, okay, I've got my money in those core passive ETFs, that's great. I'm getting market returns, but you know what? I still want a little bit more. I, I don't I don't believe that active managers can persistently outperform, which is what a lot of studies show. So what can I do? Um, and this really new, well, not new, but this exciting category of ETFs kind of lets you have the best of both worlds in, in, in a way. So smart beta ETFs, um, if we scroll to the next slide, Owen, um, oh, sorry, so this kind of illustrates what I was just talking through. So the blue line there is the market, your core ETFs, and the gray line is an active manager. Mm. So you can see that active managers, and this is, a, this is a quality active manager, during particular parts of the market cycle, that manager does provide a performance over the broad markets. That's the MISCI world. Uh, the MISCI world is just a broad market capitalization uh, weighted index. Mm-hmm. However, you know, indices now don't need to just be that passive or that that vanilla. They can be a bit smarter. They can be a bit um, more targeted in how they select stocks. What I mean by this is still using a passive strategy. So still an index methodology that says we will buy this stock and that stock depending on 
these variables. But instead of it saying we'll buy the largest stocks listed on the ASX 200, we can say we will buy the stocks that have the highest quality metrics in the world. Mm. Um, so if you scroll down to the next slide, this orange, this orange line here, which has you can almost not see the grey active manager line anymore because that, act, that orange line is mirroring it, that is a passive ETF that's just tracking what we call a smart beta index. So it's aiming to do the you know, screening process that active screening processes that active managers would do uh, to screen for a universe of uh, quality companies, but then not undertaking the stock picking afterwards. And what you can see is you can get, you know, active like returns, um, but from a passive index ETF, which has some pretty significant advantages. If we look to the next slide, Owen, um, you'll see this. On the bottom right hand side, just uh, I just jumped cameras, but um, on the bottom right hand side there, you can see the fee load of the five largest quality active managers and the fee load of beta shares QLTY. So this is our global quality leaders ETF, and you can see you're getting actually against these five largest quality managers a better outcome than all five at a lower fee and typically at lower levels of concentration. Mm. So it's that's really quite interesting, Tom. Sorry, just to jump in real quick. That's quite interesting there because you're basically illustrating, and I think you've got a slide on this, and I was commenting on off air about this, but this effectively here, what you're saying is like you're getting a similar performance in this time period, which looks like about five years or so, eight is five years. Um, it You're getting a similar performance and risk outcome from your investment, but at a much, much lower fee load, which is, arguably like where you're kind of trading off, like what are you getting for the extra fees that justify that return? Mm -hmm. um, and it, to your point around, like you can use this kind of like regimented process of like following index, smart beta index in this case. Um, and because you do that, rather than having the fund managers and their analysts and their team, you can actually lower costs and deliver s similar outcomes, which is really impressive. Exactly right. Exactly right. And it, it kind of raises the question, which is, a slide we'll come to, which you alluded to. We can even jump there now, actually. I think it's the next slide down. Yeah, it kind of raises the question. Okay, we we, we, we kind of know, we hypothesize that uh, most active managers, they start with a broad universe of stocks and then they have, you know, certain metrics that they'll screen for to, to make that universe smaller so they can do, you know, their stock picking processes on a small number of companies, right? So step one here is that screening process that says, okay, Here's all the companies in the world. Please give me the ones that have the highest return on equity, that have you know the greatest earning stability, that have the lowest you know levels of leverage or reasonable levels of leverage, and that filters down to a, a more condensed basket of stocks. And what a smart beta ETF will typically do, it'll say, okay, we'll now just hold that whole basket of stocks, um, and we'll put a, a stock cap on it. So for our beta shares quality leaders ETF, um, we put a two percent stock cap. So it means you're fairly well diversified across the basket. And that's it. That's where it stops. For active managers, they then say, okay, we're going to hire a team and, and pay a team of, you know, financial professionals to undertake lots of research and on specific companies. And in doing so, we're going to choose the best companies in that basket of 300. And, you know, hopefully then we should outperform. What we're finding is that they don't, typically outperform in that second stage um, and, and it just costs higher fees for investors. So it's why I'm really excited about this, this style of ETF because, you know, um, I like many investors would, would love to, you know, outperform by targeting particular factors over the course of the business cycle. And, and, you know, these types of ETFs are allowing us to do so. Um, so if we jump to the final slide on this section, Owen, you can see it's been a pretty, um, oh, no, sorry, one more. We, we, we can skip over that one. That's fine. Um, it's been growing fairly steadily, the asset under management in this category. Uh, so it now makes up about 11% of the total AUM. Um, I would expect, notwithstanding, as I mentioned before, the, you know, the conversion FUM growth we'll see from active managers, I expect this to be the other fastest growing mm. segment of ETFs in Australia, if, if I had to pick one. Yeah, cool. And we're going to see more things like quality or different factor style ETFs um, potentially, you know, being used by investors, which is which is really neat. And we, we kind of see that in the US experience, right? Like 
they we see a lot of that like momentum etfs and oh, those types of things yeah there's there's i mean compared to just just in general when you look at the us etf industry there's there's an etf for everything. there's even etfs now on individual stocks uh which we haven't got to that level here yet in Australia. <laughs> but um yeah they've got every factor under the sun i think there's something someone, someone told me there's 300 or something identified factors now apparently and i reckon they've probably got <laughs> close to that 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 many covered in the u.s market we're not quite there yet in the aussie market but um, i'm sure we'll see more of those mainstream yeah, factors come out, like momentum for instance I'd, I'd be surprised we didn't see a momentum factor come out soon yeah for sure yeah and so this one thematic ETFs, i've labeled the surprise um so thematic ETFs, i think it's fair to say they get a large amount of the media and a large amount of interest um from investors so much so that I, I had hypothesized that they would make up, you know, a fairly decent chunk of the Australian ETF industry. Yeah, you know, I would I would I would have guessed maybe around five, six percent, um, hmm. which is typically what I what I would kind of hold as thematic ETFs in my portfolio is kind of was kind of my logic. Um, thematic ETFs, they're a really great access vehicle. Um, so if we jump to the next slide, when we talk about I should probably provide some scope not everyone will know so when i talk about a thematic etf i'm talking about an etf that's giving you access to typically a related typically related equities in some type of future growth area so you, you can think about you know global cyber security there is an etf that tracks the largest global cyber security sorry the largest global cyber security companies mm -hmm. um, and i'll call it a thematic etf there's electric vehicle etfs climate change innovation ETFs, um, these type of themes um, fall under this category. And they're really good and really beneficial for a well-diversified portfolio because they provide access to, you know, long-term potentially high growth strategies. They're fairly, um, that usually fit, don't get access to these companies in broad market indices. Um, you know, these ETFs tend to be pure play what I mean by that is they target like the, the smaller companies that really focus on that area. Because of course, if we think of the largest tech companies in the world, well, they're actually some of the biggest cloud computing companies, some of the biggest cybersecurity companies as well. If, if you know about Microsoft cybersecurity and, and um, mm. you know, what they've done there, but these, these ETFs tend not to hold those larger companies. They look for more pure play um, companies to give a good exposure to the particular thematic. Um, mm. So they, yeah, just, I guess, sometimes they're, they're really good you know, diversification piece and access vehicle in portfolios. Um, and if we scroll to the next slide, please, Owen. Thanks, mate. So, yeah, you can, given the um, given the color differences, and this is almost um, <laughs> this is almost um, quite relevant. Or, I can't think of the words off my head, but um, almost quite relevant. This has happened. You can't even really see the thematic ETFs AUM in this slide but maybe on your screens it's a bit bigger but that little gray bar on the bottom is the amount of assets under management in thematic etfs compared to the entire australian etf uh, universe so it sits around three percent um hmm. which as i mentioned was surprising to me given the amount of media we hear and, and interest we hear in thematic etfs it's probably lower than i would have expected wow so that's when you think about that how much do investors talk about different thematic ETFs, right? You know, you, you see people talking online, talking to their friends. Um, they're always interested to talk about the latest and greatest industry, AI, these types of things. But then you see it in action and it's actually, I didn't realize it was actually that that small as a as a consideration, you know? Yeah, no, it's, it's quite, and just, it goes to show that I guess, yeah, the, the bulk of investors' money is going into those core building blocks which is which is good to see in a way um you know thematic etfs are great but they can they, they are high growth so they're more high risk and highly volatile so you typically wouldn't again i don't know any of the, the individual investors situations on here but you tend to hold a, a smaller portion in your portfolio in thematic type funds those higher growth higher risk type funds um, yeah agreed yeah and yeah it's um if you're watching this and you're thinking well What's my exposure to these things? Well, you can kind of get a sense from what Tom's put together here of what the industry as a whole and what investors as a whole are doing. Um, it might give you kind of like a reality check on maybe where, you know, you can think about your portfolio going in time. It's mm -hmm. cool. I like yeah, that. It's a good caveat. Yeah, great. And so that brings us to 
Oh, it brings us actually to our suite of thematic ETFs we have here at BetaShares. Um, so like I mentioned, yeah, it, it, they are amazing access vehicles and they're good. You know, the core of the portfolio, although that's the bulk, for a lot of investors, they, they especially you know, investors on this pod, on this webinar, sorry, you know, are probably pretty engaged, pretty interested in, and like to be a bit more hands-on. And so it's awesome to do some research into areas you like and add these to the portfolio. Um, mm. Because that core part of the portfolio, which we talked about earlier, you kind of want to just be a bit boring and mm. stick to your asset allocation and not really do much else. This is where you can have a lot of fun around the edges. I know that we've spoken in the past about hack in particular. We've spoken about Asia last week, I think it was. We spoke about RBTZ a few times as well. So those definitely, uh, I mean, imagine most people that are watching this would be familiar with those ETFs, but there's a yeah. whole heap in the suite there. Yeah, well, almost contrary to, to everything I've just said, Hack, our, our global cybersecurity ETF, is actually our fourth largest equity fund. Um, wow. So wow. just to undo everything I've just spent 10 minutes saying, there you go. <laughs> That's not a large part anyway. Um, and, yeah, that brings us to the yeah, final broad category um, I looked at, I looked at a few more. This is the final one I wanted to, wanted to talk about, and it was fixed income ETFs. Um, and I think, I think on the podcast we did recently, oh, and I, I might have brought out um, this statistic. Um, and the statistic was last time the Australian ten-year government bond yield was at five percent, which was back in two thousand and twelve. Um, there were zero cash and fixed income ETFs available in Australia, and today there are fifty-three. Um, mm. And due to that, I've, I've labelled this category, you know, a new era because we're entering or we've entered a new era for fixed income. Uh, we've seen yields at levels we've not, seen, we've not seen for over a decade, which is really interesting. Um, at the same time that we've got cash and fixed income ETFs for the first time. So on that first point, since yields have increased so much um, and we're missing the number. Oh, yeah, you can kind of give you an idea. So the first grey bar... In each of those categories of the first um, five bars is just showing us the yields about a few years ago on you know fixed income securities, which were really low. It wasn't mm-hmm. much in fixed income, and how much those yields have increased today, particularly compared to those final two bars, which is showing us the yield or the earnings yield on the market. So the earnings yield on the market's barely gone up, uh, but yeah. on fixed securities it's grown a lot. So that means on a relative basis, fixed income has become a lot more interesting for of investors. Mm. So I might double click on this and just confirm what you're saying just to make sure I've got this correct. Effectively, you're showing like the yield across. In this case, we've got the RBA interest rate. Uh, we've got uh, government bond yields here, inflation adjusted. Then we've got like corporate bonds by the looks of it, um, senior bank notes. Um, and then it keeps going on and on and on. But then at the end here, this is for the stock market. So this is the US stock market. This is the... Aussie market in terms of dividend yields on average. And what you're focusing on here is the change between the two. So even though the stock market still yields quite respectable amounts, it's actually the growth in these other ones which are quite interesting as well because you're seeing some of those bonds start to yield a lot more and get a lot more interesting for people. That's exactly right. Yeah. Bang yeah, on. cool. I, lo- I love how you've – Um, I didn't actually – when I saw this chart come through, I wasn't actually 100% sure, but this is like – this is a really good representation of what people can do with their portfolios with ETFs now, right? Like you now have the defensive side of your portfolio, which is invested in these types of things, all of a sudden yielding much more than it was previously. Exactly right. And so, you know, this, you know, availability of fixed income and cash ETFs, um, which has been around for a little bit longer, but coinciding with this new fixed income market, if we, if we scroll to the next slide there, you can see that we've seen, um, huge amount of inflows into listed fixed income exposures. So mm. this is just, this is really drilling into that stat that I mentioned earlier. So, you know, 10 years ago, investors had no option but to use unlisted fixed income exposures for, for their, um, mm. for, for getting their fixing on that defensive part of the portfolio. Um, what we've seen over the past 18 months with the availability of fixed income ETFs, we've seen, pretty substantial outflows from unlisted fixed income exposures, which are the black bars, um, and pretty consistent inflows into listed fixed income ETFs. So this kind of comes back again to that discussion we had right at the start about an ETF just being a fund structure. 
Um, mm. And investors' preference for using a listed structure rather than an unlisted structure because of some of the benefits we, we touched on earlier. And, you know, ETFs are that, you know, main listed structure that, that investors are using. Yeah, so people are now able to build full professionally styled portfolios in effect using their own platform. Like in the past to access these types of things, you'd have to fill out the paperwork on a website or see your financial advisor. But now all of a sudden you can do basically all of the core components um, just in one place, which is pretty pretty amazing. Yeah, exactly. I mean, they're, they're just amazing access vehicles to, to a whole whole different, um, you know, all different, all different asset classes uh, now, which is great to see. And, you know, given... Given what we just kind of talked about, the the you know how interesting the fixed income market has gotten, or how you know more relatively attractive fixed income assets have become, we've really seen substantial growth in fixed income ETFs over the past twelve to eighteen months. So the past twelve months, almost sixty percent of the net flows into the Australian ETF industry have come from cash and fixed income ETFs, which is wow. pretty remarkable. Yeah. Um, you know, historically has always been dominated by equities. What what this is saying to me, what, what I take away from this is in the earlier days when, you know, there were equity ETFs available, remember that very first chart, it took quite a while for investors to start using equity ETFs. There was, you know, pretty flat growth for the first 10 or so years. As investors became more comfortable with those, they started using these core passive ETFs, they started using some um, smart beta ETFs and active ETFs, so they're, they're more comfortable with the structure. And as we enter a new fixed income market, they're saying, okay, I, I'm comfortable with the ETF structure. I can see there are cash and fixed income ETFs available. That's the obvious place for me to go now. Um, so it's really good uh, to see continued adoption across different asset classes for ETFs as you know, investors' education um, continues to grow. Yeah, I, I love that. And um it's like you've said, like people have already recognized that ETFs are the future of investing. They don't need to be convinced on that anymore. It's just making these fixed income ETFs available mm -hmm. to say retirees or would be retirees who are looking for passive income. They're just them being there and the financial advisors recognizing they're an option has been enough to just encourage and foster this rapid adoption, which is great to see. Yeah, it's exactly right. And um, look, I won't go into these in, in any amount of detail. You, Obviously, I'll be recording this after, so you can pause on this slide if you're interested. But you know, at BetaShares, um, we've got the, the largest suite of cash and fixed income ETFs available to the market. Uh, I can see Hammer had a good question around one of our newest funds, which is our money market ETF, which we might get to in a, in a second. Um, but this just shows the, the level of availability just from BetaShares across fixed income ETFs now. It's, mm. quite, it's quite amazing. We've got you know, cash ETFs, cash at the bank, and, and money market securities. Um, across to bank hybrids, uh, we've got corporate corporate bonds, we've got US bonds, we've got you know, inflation protected US bonds. So um, again, it just talks this, I think the, the overriding message um, as we get to the end of, of the presentation part of this webinar is to say, you know, ETFs are just a great access vehicle that are more and more giving investors access to different investment strategies. Um, and we see, and, and as investors become comfortable with that, they're, they're using them more and more. Um, I think that's just that that access vehicle point is really important. Yeah, absolutely. Having it available is the the kind of that's what that's what we, we needed as individual investors is the ability to invest in these products, these professional ETFs that we could now you know add to our portfolios. I love yeah, it. Yeah, exactly right. So look, that that kind of sums up everything. Um, you know, I wanted to cover at a high level. I, I want any, anything from you or maybe we, we open to questions or whatever you, whatever you feel is best. Um, what I might say is that people can uh, head to the BetaShares website. If you come across anything that Tom or I mentioned today and you want to learn more, you want to request a fact sheet, you want to look at um, the PDS, head to the BetaShares website because there's even some great tools in here. Uh, I know you've got the comparison uh, tool as well yeah. where people can put yeah, ETFs right. side by side. So head to the BetaShares website if you are confused and, of course, read the product disclosure statement. And one final warning, we will have some time now for some, for some questions for Tom, guys. So please get your questions into us now. Um, but maybe we can start with Hammers, who did ask about the MMKT ETF mm -hmm. versus AAA, which is one that Rob was mentioning earlier on, saying from SelfWealth, BetaShares AAA is the favorite among SelfWealth millionaires, mm -hmm. uh, which is quite an endorsement. Yeah. 
but now you've got MMKT. So maybe it's a question from Hammer of like, what's the difference between this and say AAA? It's actually, it's a, it's a surprisingly interesting question given we're talking about cash. Um, because for a lot of investors, when we think about cash, we think about you know dollars in our hand, money in our bank account, and we can extend that to, let's say, term deposit accounts. And that's what I think probably a lot of investors would think about as cash, but the finance industry defines cash a bit more broadly than that. Um, that's, that's one part. There's also what we call money market securities, um, mm-hmm. which are generally, generally very short dated uh, securities issued by governments, banks, and some large corporations um, for short term funding uh, requirements. Now, what MMKT is, it's access to the whole universe of cash, you know, traditional cash mm-hmm. and money market securities. So this still fits in the cash, you know, asset class and the core cash part of your portfolio um, because we, we classify these instruments as, as cash-like. So to your question, Hammer, um, AAA is just going to be purely cash in a bank account uh, and in, you know, short-term accounts. Mm-hmm. Um, so that traditional thought process for many people. Money market extends it out to hold these, you know, money market securities. And what that means is you're taking a little bit more of perceived risk, um, but you are receiving a little bit higher income. You can see the average credit rating there, A-1. Um, mm-hmm. Some might not be familiar. This is a, a short-term credit rating, which is different to your traditional, you know, triple A plus. Uh, that's the highest short-term credit rating you can get. So it's still the highest credit rating you can possibly have for short-term credit. And you get a bit of a pickup on the yield of AAA. Um, again, coming back to this access vehicle point, if we look at what large institutions both here in the US use for their cash allocation, they use lots of money market securities. And traditionally, you know, everyday investors couldn't really access these securities, but money market, the new fund, gives that access. So it's really awesome. And again, using the US as an, exa- as an example, they just reached a record number of assets under management in their money market funds over there. There is US $6 trillion now in money market funds in the US, which is just uh, incredible. Unbelievable number. Trillion with a T. <laughs> yeah, I know. A US trillion as well. Uh, yeah. Insane. Yeah. I might step in with one maybe final question for you, um, which is that, like, is there anything else about like the future of ETF investing that's really interesting to you? So like we've obviously seen people using ETFs for do, like share broad share market core uh, ETFs, as you mentioned, we've seen like the Matic, Smart Beta, some active fund managers are offering mm-hmm. uh, their investment portfolios inside an ETF structure. Um, we've got this rise of fixed income, particularly in 2023 in terms of people like piling in. Um, not necessarily like a forecast, but like, what are you watching in the future? Like, what are you looking at and thinking, well, that's something that investors should be able to like keep an eye on or should be interested in keeping an eye on? Yeah, that's a really, it's a really good question because I do, I do like to, to keep an eye on those opportunities. And one that, one that stands out for me and one that I'm just personally really interested in is something called direct indexing. I um, mean, we might even talk about this before, Owen, um, but direct indexing is the, possibility for investors to create and modify their own indices and have a fun track that they can buy into, which is a really cool concept and it would be a really cool future iteration of, of ETFs. So if we, for example, right now, say you've, you know some of your investors are using the Australia 200 ETF, um, the A200 ETF, yeah, which tracks a pretty passive, pretty, pretty um, vanilla index. With direct indexing, you know, I could go along and say, okay, I like the ASX 200, but I don't want much fossil fuel exposure. Or, you know, to our earlier example on Smart Beta, I want the companies with the highest return on equity. Uh, I don't want fossil fuel exposure and give me, you know, five of the best companies in the 300 as well. And so you're making these more specific rules for your index that, you know, an individual index provider isn't going to put out a fund that niche because it might only appeal to a few people. Well, with direct indexing, that that may become possible where investors can create their own rules um, for their funds they're tracking, which I think would be a really interesting um, uh, thought experiment as well, because 
Uh, we, we've already talked about how some active fund manager or most active fund managers can't beat the benchmark. And I think a lot of investors would play around with direct investing and, and mm. be it for, I, th I think ESG is a big, a big application of it, but also, you know, individual investors trying to outperform the market. Um, it'd be great to see, you know, yeah. how many could do so. Or if you and I could even do so, I would know we'd be back yeah. to the, the broad passive uh, indices in, in quick time. Yeah, because this is, um, again, maybe following the, the lead of the United States, for folks that don't know, this ability to like tinker, let's call it like that, or modify um, your ETF and your portfolio um, quickly and easily could be something that's like here in Australia. Um, I know beta shares are super innovative in this way and kind of like democratizing access to all these types of things. So uh, if you want to follow along, not just with what Tom produces, there's a free insights tab on the beta shares website, but you can subscribe to the beta shares newsletter there's a fun comparison tool which i don't think we've shared much on uh, the rest live sh show so far but i'll probably be using it more in 2024 you can actually go onto the beta shares website and you can put etf side by side and compare them for a range of different factors that you'll want to look at so go and check those out don't forget the product disclosure statements and tmds on there as well but tom this is heaps of fun mate you and i get to chat regularly thanks for bringing your slides sorry about the color i know how Good your slides are but uh, converting it to canva uh, calls me a few headaches and uh i really appreciate it though mate because um you're a wealth of knowledge and uh, if i don't see you before christmas merry christmas and thanks for thanks for joining myself and everyone here in the community yeah. today thanks so much John. always a pleasure to join and i love your um i love your engaged audiences so merry christmas to all and hopefully see you all again in the new year cheers mate cheers tom thanks for joining us from melbourne all right that was tom wickenden joining us from beta shares um, I would highly encourage everyone that's watching to check out the BetaShares website, in particular the fund comparison tools there, uh, because they make a lot of sense from like just to be able to visualize things side by side. Maybe you want to look at performance. Maybe you want to look at other factors. So um, go and check that out. And a lot of the things that Tom referenced today, I know there was a question here uh, from David about sharing the slides. Apologies if they were blurred. Sometimes on YouTube, David, um, you need to turn up the resolution of your, your own screen in order to see the full, um, you need to adjust it in the setting. Sometimes YouTube doesn't feed you the, the full picture. Uh, but if not, a lot of those slides, in fact, most of the concepts that Tom was talking about are available on the insights tab of the BetaShares website. Like a lot of that data is on there for like fixed income and for the different types of ETFs and the industry as a whole. Uh, so go and check those out uh, over there. But um I just want to maybe double click on the other slides that we had. Uh, so I've got one, I've got my closing uh, quote for this for this week, which is from Charlie Munger, the late Charlie Munger, may he rest in peace. He said, it's easier to avoid stupidity than it is to seek brilliance. This is the same quote that I used last week and I did it deliberately because today we're talking about ETFs. And I think in the invest in, investing industry, what I've come across after doing this for many years and interviewing hundreds of people, which is that, the investors that tend to do the best and actually create wealth for themselves and for them, their families, these people are the people that are the most humble in the way they go about their investing. They're not out there bragging about which stock they bought or what they did um, at a particular time or how they timed the market. They're the, they're the people that just continually put a thousand bucks into their investing account a month or into their favorite ETF, they chuck five grand in or they get a dividend and they reinvest it. Those are the people that do so well in my experience and even the, the really wealthy people. And I often think to myself, it was a really interesting thought exercise. If, if someone walked up to me, you know, on the street today and they gave me $10 million, what would I do with it? And I often think to myself, well, the easiest answer is I'd put almost, almost all of it into ETFs most likely. And then I'd maybe have a little bit of money that I leave for individual stocks, but only a very small amount. And I think if you think about that, like what are you actually trying to do with your portfolio? You're probably trying to invest in a way that grows wealth over time consistently. Um, you're taking some risk by investing in the stock market or whatever, but you don't need to swing for the fences anymore. And I think that's what this quote is about. It's about not necessarily trying to shoot the lights out. It's just about, it's just about trying to avoid mistakes. Um, and that's why I love just this one quote that I think I could double click on again. So don't forget next week, we've got uh, Pete Wargent. Many of you know Pete. Uh, he's a seven-time author now. Um, he's also a co-host on the Australian Property Podcast. So we'll be talking about not necessarily the debate between property versus shares, but the, the ability to use property and shares. And I'll give you a good example. Um, a good example of this is kind of like 
one of the regrets that I have, and the regrets is what we touched on in that that uh, this form here. If you haven't already had a chance, please take some time today. I'll pop it again in the in the chat. I'm going to share the results from this in the next, probably early next year. Um, but one of the regrets I have is that I put all of my money into investing early in my 20s. And while that might sound like a good thing, and it was a good thing, it wasn't the best thing that I could have done. The best thing I could have done is I could have bought a property and then redrawn that equity. So you use the money to buy the property. And then you draw a line of credit back off that property once you get equity in it. And you use that equity to buy shares and ETFs because the, the line of credit that you pull back from the property is tax deductible. It's at a lower rate of interest than any other type of loan because it's secured against your property. And you can earn franking credits if you select the right ETFs or shares. So that that's probably, it's not necessarily that I made a mistake in my 20s. It's just that if I was more proactive and thought more about how I can use property and shares, I would have been far further ahead than I am today. Far, far further ahead. And um, that's just an example of what I'm trying to capture in this survey. So if you do have five or 10 minutes, maybe you do it today, maybe you do it tonight, please take some time. Um, I'd really appreciate it to share what you, what you have learned and what's worked for you. Um, so we'll be talking with Pete next week. Pete's got a few books. I think his first book was Get a Financial Grip. He was financially independent, I think, at 33 years of age. So he had effectively could retire. And I'm sure we'll get to this next week. But nowadays, Pete has 15 properties, I believe. And he's not one of these people that just go and collect investment properties and brags about it. But I say that because he's actually very accomplished in what he does. Um, and he's very effective in the way he's used both shares and property. And he's a big proponent of index funds. Uh, early in his life. And then finally, we'll finish with a Christmas special where we'll review the year. So that's it for me for today. I can see Octavian said, would you consider the quality ETF a core investment? And how would you rate the quality ETF? That's a good question, Octavian. Obviously, quality is from beta shares. Um, I think the quality ETF is actually one of those really hard questions to answer because the ETF itself is actually quite low cost. So you could almost put it in the core of your portfolio. But it could also be considered a satellite position because it also does something that's different to a lot of people's core. So it all depends on the makeup of a portfolio. And for example, if you use the quality ETF um, or any quality factor ETF, you've got to just be aware of the overlap between that ETF and the remaining part of your core portfolio. Because say you had the S&P 500 and it's got Apple, Microsoft, I don't know, NVIDIA and all those big tech companies, chances are those are also quality companies according to the quality ETF. So they might be included in both of your ETFs, in which case you're doubling up your exposure. So you've just got to make sure that when you sit down and go, I want to put 30% of my money, for example, in international shares, you've got to make sure that you don't have all of a sudden 40% because you've added another ETF, which you thought was different but it ended up investing in the same things because some of the companies that are inside the S&P 500, for example, are also inside the quality ETF. That's probably the first thing to do is like to know your top down strategy, like how much am I investing in this asset class? How much in that one? That's the first thing. Obviously that relates to the long-term risk profile and your long-term financial goals, which I do not know. And then from there you go, okay, well, how much do I want to spend in fees within that portfolio? Like what, Am I willing to allocate? Obviously, in the satellite, I'm, as I've said in the past, I'm much more willing to have high fees. In the core, I'm willing to have high fees, but only if it gives me something that's unique. Um, fortunately, with the quality ETF, it's actually not that high in fees, which is why it could kind of, depending on the investor, it could probably go either way. Um, but it is one of those ETFs which um, is hard to nail down because it basically depends on the investor. I hope that adds some context to how I think about it, Octavian. And uh, Hammer, you did say ShareSite now does a nice report to show you overlap percentages within your ETF holdings. Yeah, that's a great report. All right, guys, so I'm back next week. We've got two more sessions before the end of the year. For anyone that's watching this back on replay, the next show will be at 6 p.m. next Wednesday night with Pete. So you can check that out live at 6 p.m. Australian Eastern time with the, the great Pete Wargent, uh, the property wonder, uh, which is Pete Wargent. We'll have a bit of fun with that. We'll, we'll, we'll ask Pete some really hard questions together. I'm sure he'll get a laugh out of it. 
and uh, we'll have a bit of fun. And then the following week, I might even get my uh, my elf hat out and we can have a bit of fun for a year in review, a Rask year in review. So that's all for today. Thank you, everyone who joined us live. Thanks for everyone that asked questions. Hammer, uh, Karina, everyone, Octavian. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Rob, for joining us from Self Wealth. Don't forget, Self Wealth is uh, a partner of Rask Live, and you can check out Self Wealth and get 10 free trades when you sign up. All right. Bye for now, guys. I hope you enjoy your wonderful Wednesday, and I'll see you next time.